uh, very briefly, I would just like to highlight three things. Uh, as many of you might have seen, uh, two months back, uh, the joint UN interagency team, they released the latest maternal mortality estimates and trends. And, and these trends uh, tell us uh, that the maternal mortality reduction is stagnating globally. However, in sub-Saharan Africa, in the last 20 years, there has been a 30% reduction. It looks good. It's a great accomplishment. We all need to celebrate. However, we need to also recognize the fact that the Africa started at a very high level. Therefore, despite the rec uh, reduction, where we stand today is completely unacceptable. So globally, around 300,000 women die because of pregnancy and birth-related condition, of which around 70% in sub-Saharan Africa. And that's we are talking about one mother dying every two and a half minutes. So since we started this panel, somewhere we have lost a mother. So, so that's something to keep in mind, and that's my first point. The second point that we all know through last 30 years of work that the single most important thing to prevent maternal mortality, to improve the functionality of the healthcare system, particularly the primary healthcare system by investing in human resources, medical products, and infrastructure. And that has been a challenge. As we speak, the latest UN estimates tells us that roughly around 50% of our primary health care units are per as functional. It's a great accomplishment. We started at a very low level, but the point here, and that's why I heard a lot of discussion around efficiency, if in a facility products are there, people are not there. Or products and people are there, simply the support ecosystem is not there. Obviously, the overall impact and outcome will be undermined. So therefore, this functionality at a minimum bringing in the product, people, and, and, and place of care together is important. And the third one, I, I conclude with that and then hand over to my first panelist. We also know, and then many people spoke about it, 90% of sexual reproductive health services could be managed through midwifery intervention. So the whole idea of midwifery-led care at the primary health center, as we speak, in Africa to make a significant difference, simply one, one type of health provider, the other, people who are providing midwifery services, they need to be increased or they need to be doubled. So currently the ambition, each country has the ambition of having at least one midwifery practitioner for 1,000 population. In reality, we have currently one for 4,000 population. So you see the magnitude of problem. And that's not true for midwifery. That's true for all of the headers of health providers, even worse in some cases. So therefore, this conversation is so important. And let me now, with those three points, invite uh, our first speaker, Dr. Ketlego. Thank you very much, and I'm honored to be part of this uh, esteemed panel. Um, the theme of the conference is on the role of the private sector in Africa's new health order, and I think the issue of the health workforce is right up there in terms of the, the priorities. Evidently, Africa is facing unparalleled challenges in providing vital health care services to its citizens. Uh, aggravated by the severe shortage of skilled medical personnel. The WHO um, estimates that Africa will need at least 6 million healthcare professionals by 2030 to address the healthcare demands on the continent. And this highlights the urgent need of innovative and collaborative solutions. The WHO Health Workforce Strategy launched in 2016 is essentially a call to action for countries to develop healthcare workforce strengthening objectives, including cooperative, cross-sectional partnership. It is my view that the private sector has a compelling role to play in addressing the human resource shortfall in healthcare. 
Comparatively, Africa is home to the greatest burden of disease globally, attributable to the shortage of healthcare workers. In comparison, other regions, such as Asia, Europe, and North America, demonstrate a relatively higher density of healthcare professionals. Signs of progress are glimpsed in several African countries uh, that have implemented some of the strategies that really a multi-stakeholder approach to ad address these persisting challenges. A strategic collaboration between the public and the private sector uh, can achieve the goal of improving healthcare service delivery, thus enhancing the quality of life for African communities. The private sector can support human resource development in the healthcare industry in multiple ways. Firstly, investing in the education and training of healthcare professionals, ensuring skill development, professional development and knowledge transfer. This includes investments in partnerships with institutions of higher learning to develop and train the next generation of healthcare professionals adequately. Furthermore, the private sector can support the development of telemedicine solutions and other technologies, enhancing access to healthcare services in rural and remote areas where there's a significant shortage of healthcare professionals. Private sector participation towards sustaining healthcare services must be anchored in an enabling environment and a framework that encourages investment technology transfer and collaboration with government-led initiatives. Governments play an essential role in facilitating this enabling environment, notably through supporting public-private partnerships with transparent government, gov governance and government mechanisms. There are various examples of successful public-private pa partnerships that demonstrate how collaborative efforts can create lasting change in health service delivery including the Clinton Health Initiative um, uh, partnership with pharmaceutical companies towards improving access to HIV medicines, uh, mobile-led, uh, device-led uh, innovations such as Instra Global Health Solutions in Nigeria that enhances patient access to quality healthcare and training resources. The government can facilitate this partnership by creating a responsive legal framework providing incentives for partnerships, development and engagement, and establishing a market-driven environment uh, of entrepreneurship. The current shortage of healthcare professionals represents an enormous challenge towards improving healthcare services in Africa. However, innovative partnerships um, between the pri 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 private and public sectors present a unique opportunity uh, towards addressing this shortfall. Partnerships can leverage the capabilities of both sectors, delivering innovative and sustainable solutions towards enhancing the healthcare delivery ecosystem. Crucially, private sector engagement should be anchored in this enabling environment that I spoke about, created through supportive regulatory uh, frameworks. Therefore, it will take collective efforts between the public and private sectors, as well as other uh, key stakeholders to transform Africa's healthcare ecosystem truly. So we need to create the opportunity, and find them, train them, and then find a way to keep in them. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, AHP, for bringing us uh, to Jobang to handle this very, very important subject of health workforce. We have had, and, I, and I'm happy, <coughs> Honorable Minister is joining us today. Yesterday she told us this is the engine, this is the glue for everything uh, that we do in the health sector. Uh, that is Uganda at a glance, a little country in East Africa, but it's proudly called the Pearl of Africa, and it is the source of the Nile, with good neighbors of Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, the country is small but highly populated. The density is quite high, uh, 42 million people, which is quite big and is increasing. With the young population of uh, mainly young people under 15, constituting 49% of the population. 
Uh, in this slide, I think we, in our conversation yesterday, we wanted to know how to leverage on innovation, on digitization. You can see the level of grid electricity, connectivity in Uganda, only 19%. So when you are uh, uh, thinking of innovation, you know that you cannot reach a lot of the people living in the villages. Now, regarding HR for Uganda, we have a doctor population ratio, currently of 1 to 25,000, uh, against the recommended 1 to 1,000 uh, population. Again, yesterday, uh, this I have just said, uh, from the system, health system building blocks, the components of the blocks of health workforce, very important, together with leadership and governance forming the glue. You have the six building blocks, all right, but you need these two to be able to really do something meaningful. I thought I would use this opportunity to just say, first of all, what we already know, in addition to what my colleague has said. We know that for us to access universal health services, we need adequate, we need qualified, and we need fairly distributed and motivated health workers. I underlined the word motivated. In most parts of the developing world, sometimes we have the health workers, but they are not motivated enough to do their work. So you have people present in the facility but they're not doing work. There's a concept of presentism. They're just present, but they're not doing the work they're supposed to do. So that we already know. We also know that there are many efforts already by many countries to address this challenge of inadequacy of healthcare, but without much success. So it's important, uh, and I'm happy that we have a conversation here to discuss this as, a, as Africans. Uh, recently, there was a study conducted by, I think, WHO to find out the actual status of the different, different categories of health workers, the availability of these workers in, in our countries. And uh, from that slide, you can see that the study found out that in across 47 countries in Uganda, we, in, in, sorry, in, in Africa, we have only 3.6 million health workers. 3.6, 47 countries. With a population of how many? 1.4 billion people. <clears throat> and this was published last year. And among this, 9% medical doctors 37% nurses and midwives, 10% laboratory personnel, as you can see in the slide. Now, this is not enough. But this is not to say that we are not training. We are training a lot of people. But maybe they're not staying in Africa. Where are they going? And this is what we want to, do, to discuss here. Secondly, from that study, it was also very clear that the distribution of the health workers that remain in Africa is not good at all. It is uneven. You find most of the health workers are concentrated mainly in the urban places, at least in Uganda. They're in the cities, they're in the towns. Go to the rural communities, you don't find people there. There is a finding that I also saw there that 85% of the 3.6 million workers, health workers that are in Africa, they're in the public sector. They are not in the private sector. But that needs to be debated a bit. Maybe the health workers that run the private sector come from the public sector. So when you, you go and do a census, they will not tell you that they're in the private sector. In Uganda, we have dual employment, and there's no law against it. So you find the same consultants that are employed by the, by the public sector, by government, are the ones running the private sector. But that's for the debate. 
So another finding was that the density of the physicians, and in this study, they looked at doctors, nurses, midwives combined per 1,000 population. And for the whole of Africa, our density is at 1.55% on average. That's all. That's what we have. And it's known that for you to begin to meaningfully think about advancing towards universal health coverage, you need a density of at least 4.45%, let's say 5%. But Africa is at 1.55, combining doctors, nurses, and midwives together per thousand population. We are still at 1.55. So can we really speak about uh, UHC and SDG? Actually, the only countries in Africa that had <clears throat> more than 4.45 percent, uh, not percent, per thousand density of uh, health workers were Seychelles, Namibia, Mauritius, and South Africa. That's all. The rest of us, as you can see in the map, I don't know whether you can go to the map, we are still in red. There's a bit of green down, and there's a bit of green up there. I thought I would use this moment to just share uh, the status as a background so that it forms a basis for our discussion. But we know that health workforce is an engine, and we have talked about that since yesterday. We also know that health workforce is not cheap, and that's why most countries are not able to hire as many. As a matter of fact, in my country, Uganda, we are having sort of a pseudo excess of health workers. The training schools, we have partnered with the private sector and we have produced so many doctors, so many nurses, so many midwives, but they cannot get employment. But that is not to say that Uganda is saturated with workers. It's just that we are not able to raise the wage bill to be able to absorb uh, these health workers in positions. Allow me to, to stop there so that we can have a discussion on the other dimensions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Joseph Okairo. And also right on time, you, you just took seven minutes. So may I invite Dr. Patrick uh, Luaga, uh, Ambassador Africa Global, African Global Health uh, also, yeah. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, some of uh, my points have been raised, so I'll be skipping those that have already been mentioned. Um, yes, next. As a background, that is really just to outline what uh, I wanted to present. Next. Um, in Africa, several human resources for health gaps persist. I think this has come out uh, from the earlier presentations. The ratios have also been alluded to. Uh, but what I wanted to kind of focus on is um, one of the solutions that, we, that can help us address uh, the human resource gap not completely, but partly, is uh, the HR, HR Human Resources for Health Integration. And that is, uh, so this is uh, a partnership, is one of the possible solutions, especially in low and middle income countries, given the existing huge gap that has been uh, talked about next. Uh, human resources for health, well, um, maybe for integration, we may ask ourselves what, is, um, what are we talking about? Uh, it's actually an essential strategic process. You don't just go into it, you have to think about it strategically. Aimed at optimizing the management and deployment of healthcare 
uh, professionals within our healthcare systems. This strategy is in pursuit of for equitable and high quality uh, healthcare services for all. Again, this is what we've been talking about, which must be in line in, uh, with sustainable development goals with its target as um, universal health care coverage. Next. Um, now, integration, human resources for health integration. Um, of course, like any other intervention, there are proponents and definitely there are challenges or skeptics. It is said that it helps to close the health workforce gap, optimizes the management and deployment of human resources for health, and avails resources wherever they are needed most, enables continuous training and performance measurement, and uh, attainment of high standards of care, facilitates better communication, information sharing, and coordinated care for patients, I think this is this is one advantage to the patient, where you have coordinated care, um, and with uh, improved outcomes, and allows for effective, efficient use of resources for equitable access, quality of care, and focuses on future healthcare needs effectively. I think yesterday we had. Uh, how we should not only focus on the current without looking at um, the future. And some argue that it offers a possibility for sustainability. However, the skeptics uh, argue that it can be a generalization and stifles, uh, may stifle innovation. Cost implications can be an opportunity cost. You may focus on, um, on integration, yet there are other, um, other burning issues to be addressed rather than looking at integration and can be complex in terms of time, effort, and coordination. It's also argued that it may impede professional autonomy and satisfaction. Uh, definitely, as I think we've had in some of the, there can be resistance to, to change. Next. Um, well, looking at what we need to do if you are to, um, to be able to implement uh, integration, we can look at what can be done by the private sector, how we can participate in helping uh, some of these strategies. In planning, I think here as private sector, we can, uh, we can make sure that we share our data uh, with the public sector and the training institutions. Training uh, for skills is also another re re uh, requirement if it is to succeed. We may offer scholarships, but um, so what we are saying here is private sector can participate in skilling the human resource. Knowledge sharing, best practices and policies, it's important that we do participate in policy making. Particularly, sometimes we may face policies that hinder the progress uh, for the private sector. So it's important that we do participate. Uh, and the issue of cutting edge technologies and innovations, well, we've talked about digital health, definitely as private sector. That is an area where we can uh, participate and data analytics and uh, improving the efficiency of the workforce. Mobilizing resources for funding, this is quite crucial. Uh, again, in skilling, we may offer to sponsor uh, or give uh, grants, but most importantly, improving infrastructure. Uh, in public, I think I've already talked about the policy, how it's important that we do participate. 
Can we go to the next, please? Now, we may ask ourselves, is it, is it possible? Is it just theory? Um, yes, we've looked at the pros and cons, but there are countries that have been able to implement this strategy of uh, human resources for health integration. In Africa, I, we only have very few, and Rwanda comes out as one of those that uh, has done something in this area and has been able to improve health uh, access and outcomes. I think generally the success stories have been able to address mainly access and improvement equity and improvement of um, the quality. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Luaga. Now, can I invite my colleague from IFC, uh, Ken Osoi? Thank you very much. Uh, so the, the IFC is uh, the private sector arm of the World Bank, uh, and our primary area of focus is uh, private sector investments. Um, there are a couple of slides that uh, I'd like to share as a background, if we can get So, I mean, what I'm trying to illustrate here is sort of uh, the ecosystem of healthcare provision. So, which ranges everything from pharmaceuticals, uh, pharmacies, healthcare providers, those who provide treatments. And as we think about healthcare, at every point of intervention, you know, first you need a primary healthcare person to diagnose if there's something wrong. Um, for them to do that, they might use, you might have phlebotomists, people who take your blood, you have diagnostics equipment, which you then use to determine what's wrong. Um, and the universe would include everything from nurses, paramedics, um, you know, I mentioned uh, pathologists, ophthalmologists, as we see increasing incidence of uh, non-communicable diseases. Uh, certain, some diseases manifest themselves in terms of impact on eyes, etc. So optometrists, um, sonographers, you know, to be able to read the, the results of, uh, uh, you know, well baby care, et cetera. Now, as we try to increase access to healthcare and also the, the number of facilities that are needed to provide healthcare, we need more skilled workers in each of these subsectors. Uh, if we can go back to the previous slide, uh, just for a second. So in each of these verticals, whether it's for treatment, diagnostics, healthcare technology, we cannot build more hospitals, get more equipment, and not have people who have the capacity to use and interpret the results from these, these treatments. So in each of these verticals, you know, the panel before lunch spoke about vaccines in Africa for Africa. Um, the announcement by USP to do more uh, generics in Africa for Africa. We need the, the, the skills to be able to complement the increase in availability. So in every single one of these verticals, uh, manufacturing, pharmaceutical manufacturing, vaccine manufacturing, and I think increasingly we need to look also, especially at tertiary and vocational training. Historically, I think the focus has been on just sort of university degrees, advanced degrees for physicians, et cetera. But a lot of these areas, you know, uh, occupational therapists, these are, these are areas where one really needs more vocational skills, uh, shorter courses, and the role of government there is also to help in curriculum development, accreditation, while the private sector can help in the delivery of, of the curriculum and also financing and also provision of internships and skills. Um, the use of, I think a big area that we keep investing in collectively as private sector is in equipment. We also talk about uh, technology, IT, um, informatics, but we need skills for people to be able to interpret and utilize these technologies. So our recommendation increasingly is to broaden the spectrum of, of skills development beyond just tertiary education to look strongly at tertiary, 
technical and vocational training, shorter courses, more internships, and then also a greater linkage towards the whole area of healthcare education. Not just physicians and nurses, but everything in between. So let me, let me leave it there, um, and then maybe leave some time for, for Q&A. Thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. And then let's finally invite Honorable Cecily Kariuki, uh, who is the CEO and founder of Reimagine Impact Associates Limited. And we are really fortunate to have her here. Uh, and then you are the only one who bring in a bit of gender balance to this panel. Uh, <laughs> next time, next time we will be better placed, hopefully. We didn't realize this. Uh, over to you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm not complaining. Um, just as fate would have it, yesterday we had one gentleman and all ladies. <laughs> so I think that we are balancing it off now. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, let me take this opportunity to thank the panel. I am actually coming in um, as a discuss discussant as opposed to actually being a core panel member. So I jumped in so that I see how do we then drive it forward before we hand it over to you so that we can get more reflections and insights from the plenary. Um, so allow me to just use a teaser. So there is a boss, and I think that boss is our moderator today. And there are two people uh, that he is supervising. One is A, the other one is B. And A isn't quite endowed in terms of, um, you know, seeing things from an abstract form and relating them to reality. B is able to see the abstract but also apply the emotions. And so they go watering the grass. It's just about summertime. And A tells B, the grass looks white. I don't know how you'd react. And B, who is better endowed, decides, no, it is green. The grass has always been. And they spend 30 minutes arguing. One is seeing white, the other one is seeing green. The one who is seeing green is perhaps right. But he engages in 30 minutes of wasting time to be able to convince A that the grass is. So, the moderator gets out and he thinks, I have employed both people, they are wasting my time and I'll be paying for both of them. What does it do? He takes a cane and really lashes B. He lashes B and B walks away disappointed because how can the boss, I was saying the right thing. I said it's green, isn't it? Can't you see? But instead of dealing with the one who is not seeing proper, I get the caning. So he goes away. After he comes down, he comes back to the moderator. And he says, why did I get the kidney? Why did you lash at me? And he said, because you know exactly what is the truth. You knew the grass is green. Why would you put 30 minutes arguing with A? Now, today I'm choosing not to be A. I'm choosing to be B. I've agreed with everything. The grass was green exactly everything. And I believe the audience does agree that all the issues that you've articulated are just what it is we are suffering from, a point of human resource. Shortage in adequacies, uh, you know, developing on the vertical. Yesterday I shared that we are very good with the techies, the technical issues. We continue to deepen our technical knowledge around the sector. But perhaps we could, do, we could now expound on what the panel has said and help me in saying Perhaps there could be some ingredients that we have missed that we need to be able to summon and call back even as my colleague Osia suggests here, we need to look at the curricula one more time. We need to interrogate it and say, so what is going to be inside of the curricula? I think we have that opportunity, or that is where we are being told to interrogate and challenge ourselves a bit further as the leaders in the sector. So I want to offer a reflection in terms of how the science of emotion works because that is where I come in, in decision making. So an event happens, and when the event happens, it moves on to the emotional brain as opposed to the rational brain. That is where it is deposited first. And what happens once it gets there, you are either going to sense a reward coming your way depending on how it lands, or you are going to uh, sense a threat. 
And I like to relate to a real case study where at one point I thought I had gone out of my way to do a job that was beyond my job description. And I made a proposal to the boss and I said maybe this is, we could improve the situation in the workplace in this way. And the boss said, who asked you to do it? I'm sure you've all gone, you've come across situations like that. How do you respond after that? You limit your creativity, you limit the need to be able to be innovative, you shrink, you feel small, you feel slighted. It ends there. If like me, you don't start looking for the next job, then I don't know, you must be very unique. But on the other hand, Osia may have gone, done exactly the same, same thing, offered a solution that was beyond his job description. And the boss says, well done, Osia. I'm happy with you. How do you respond? You feel appreciated, you feel engaged, you feel valued, and tomorrow you go beyond that. Now, the sense of emotions in terms of how we make decisions in the workplace follows a similar path. If you feel appreciated, useful, then there is a reward and you go beyond. That is where your creativity begins. That is where you go beyond your call of duty to do a lot more. That is where tomorrow, instead of reporting to work at six, you will actually be reporting at five. And instead of leaving, and your level of job satisfaction is that much higher. Because you know the boss will come again and say, well done. And you'll take on assignments that you'd on a normal day not take. Now, once you have made that decision, whether there's a reward or a threat, you then allow the thinking brain to kick in. It kicks in and you make a decision which informs how you behave. Now, question would be, in the workplace, in the health sector where we are at, the generation that is currently performing or working is exposed to all those things we are speaking about. But perhaps I would want to suggest we interrogate a few more things in terms of now applying the analogy of this person who works a lot hard and is appreciated. And we need to do that at this point in time because there are too many shifts that we can afford to assume the 3% of the labor, the workforce that we have in the sector in Africa will remain there. Google, Microsoft, whomever, the techie guys, they've all come around. We are looking for people who would be versatile, understand a bit of what's happening in the sector, but a lot of them are looking to actually move, the millennials and the Gen Zers. World Economic Forum proposes that 30% of the millennials and the Gen Zers at any one point are looking to move to the next job. I don't think the health sector is immune. It's not immune because they'll, they'll move, they're moving. So the question then would be, with the shifts that we have witnessed, again, it's a very challenging health sector in terms of the new diseases that are kicking in, the epidemics, and the next, God knows, COVID, by the time it comes in, what response shall we have given as a leadership or the thought leaders in the sector? I have a few thoughts. Leadership style will need to necessarily change to be able to keep our workers more engaged. They're asking to be given more flexibility. And I believe my sister here, the young doctor from Morocco, you're looking to be given more flexibility. So you can attend as many African or global health conferences and meet this wonderful gentleman as often as you can. That is your age, that is your space. 30% of them are looking to keep moving, even as they drive um, innovation back home. They are looking for flexibility. Do we have a leadership that is going to be sensitive to that? These young people, the millennials, Gen Zs, asking to be allowed to course correct a decisions are happening. They don't belong where we did, where you needed to consult and go through the hierarchies and consult and consult some more. They're asking to be allowed for course correction the way they do in the techie spaces. They're also looking for a lot more space or leg room in terms of the work-life balance. In fact, in the developed, and world, the developed world, and I'm sure my colleagues, you know that, they are looking for live work balance, not the other way around. 
they are moving away from the work-life balance to life-work balance. Life first, and then we work. That is where the Gen Zers are going to give us a challenge. They are looking to be allowed to engage in continuous learning. They are looking to be allowed to lead through uncertainty and be guided accordingly. They're actually asking us, the leaders, to engage our emotional, intellectual capabilities than we did in the past. Are we prepared? Do we have the EQ capabilities that are high enough to allow for this kind of environment where we find ourselves handing over the baton? Now, those are some of the reflections. But on the other hand, the Gen Zers and the Millennials that I happen to have engaged in, in my days also as a cabinet secretary for youth, they are asking to be allowed to feedback, not in one way, not in one direction. We received that and it was okay. They are asking that the feedback continues in a loop. As you tell them, let them also tell you they are looking for reverse mentorship. They know, they are asking for their creativity and innovation to be allowed in decision making. They are asking for a lot more and they are quietly quitting. They will leave. Never mind you've put in six, seven years of taking them through basic university education to be in the clinical space. They are asking for you, the leader, to carry on and lead as a coach. Understand what they are looking for. Now, my offer in terms of expanding the space, and I agree with everything, on the vertical, we are getting everything right, perhaps. Perhaps we need then to push the envelope a little bit and look at the horizontal. How does the horizontal in terms of developing these new teams to take over from us look like? Are we applying ourselves to the EQ or the emotional intelligence competencies, or are we stuck with our intellectual content competencies? They are asking, are we so self-aware that we are able to project empathy as leaders? Do we know how to self-manage ourselves, and are we being sensitive to also allow them to self-manage? I want to propose colleagues that perhaps a time has come that we relook the, the template in terms of what is inside. Our colleagues have shared with us the how, where we are at, the status, and a bit of the how, and with whom. I want to offer two, three points for us to reflect on. We have used a lot of research from the developed, the developed world to inform our development templates. Is it time for us to domesticate and do a bit of research in terms of the connectivity between the leadership style, job satisfaction, engaging with the labor or the workers, and they are staying and increasing their level of satisfaction? There is a research question that perhaps we need to interrogate to input into models and approaches that are going to help us to retain the talent so that they don't need to move to keep them engaged. The second proposal is for us to need, the need for us to develop our emotional, intellectual capabilities. And as we do so as leaders, we also help the guys as we review the curricula to also develop so that they can self-manage better, so that they can improve on their relationship, uh, both in the team, as, as teams, but also on the vertical. And finally, I want to be proposing that we need to perhaps look at the style. How do we show up as leaders? Do we show up and expect that we will be saying because we know it, or do we show up and allow them to actually be the ones to come up with the proposals and solutions because it is one of the ways of engaging the skilled workers. And I agree with everything else. Now there is sufficient science and evidence and research that is confirming about 50% in the commercial sector, 50% has been recorded in terms of reducing turnover when we apply ourselves in this kind of manner. When leaders show up in a manner that they're engaging the workers, that they're allowing them the flex that they're looking for, and that indeed they're allowing for reverse mentorship so that the creativity can be expressed. The research also goes ahead to show in this kind of workspaces and environments, 38% productivity has been recorded to have gone up. And I think the sector we are in is no different. 
In the health space, looking at the, some of the published research, there's conclusion that employees with a higher IQ and leaders who carry high IQs are more likely to deliver on better quality, particularly of patient care. That is all published research that we could all refer to, which then gives me the proposal or hypothesis that we need to test further in the, the African context that to deal with the inadequate, inadequacy in numbers, the demotivation levels, the quiet quitting, the uneven distribution, but also the balance in terms of executing jointly with the private sector through the partnerships that have been articulated here, it may be possible what ingredient that we may be lacking in terms of developing our managers and leaders has to do with converting from very IQ um, skills development, the short-term skills development programs and lacing it a little bit or aligning it or tilting it more towards the EQ and also for us as leaders even as we give it to them. I will stop there and offer those reflections for now and hand back to you, moderator, to see whether we are able to reflect together with this wonderful audience. Again, I sign off truly, Cecilia Karaoke, you know where you can get me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So how much, how much time you have? I'm aware that, okay, we have another panel after this. We are done almost, right? So, you, okay, so we can't take any, any observation from the floor. Yeah, so, so uh, thank you so much. Uh, so basically, as, as all the panelists pointed out, uh, amazing work uh, 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 in many, many places being done. Uh, so nobody is questioning that Africa needs more health providers. Uh, and then increasingly we are doing better, but uh, the, the maybe examples of how private sector could be a big partner uh, in, 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 in producing more provider. The other area also was spoken around quality of some of our providers and in different cadres of provider, and which I think, and in many, many good examples, the technology can play a very important role uh, in, in continuous learning and, 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 and continuing education. And as you speak, we have just started a regional initiative, particularly looking at the midwifery skills uh, with a private sector institution, and we are reaching out 150,000 midwives across 23 countries for their uh, continuous learning and, and skill, uh, skill upgradation. And the third area, which is the most tricky one, the retention, and then the point which made, even if you produce more, if you're not able to keep them within the country or within the public sector, uh, what does it mean? And then the retention is complex and traditionally, as she pointed out, uh, we have thought a lot about financial incentive and perhaps neglected other aspects to keep people going. And, 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 and she pointed out uh, overwhelming research and a huge initiative in my own institution, many private sector institutions. The psychological safety itself can enhance uh, retention and, and, and satisfaction by 50% or so, and that's what she was trying to say. So there are, there are great opportunities here. Uh, we didn't get time to look at some of the ongoing and um, private sector partnership which are going in many, many countries, particularly during COVID-19, which perhaps we need to learn a bit of lessons from there and, and, and go and scale it up. So what I will request that, okay, if you are aware of any good private sector partnership, either in the space of uh, producing a new provider, improving their quality or retaining them, please email them to uh, Africa Health Business and, and then we will put something together and then try to have engagement on that. I'll stop there. Thank you so much.